Welcome back to the Redacted Culture Cast. This is the... Uh, I don't even know what day or time this one's coming out anymore. We're actually that far ahead. However, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a couple of weeks, if not almost a month now. Uh, but Fred is returning, so uh, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm Fred. I'm just a man, just like That's... all of you. <laughs> no, uh, uh, military background, obviously retired a couple of years ago. Um, uh, Air Force combat controller. So primary job was, you know, air to ground integration type stuff, whatever that might be. Comms, air lands, air drops, whatever it is. Uh, dropping bombs, et cetera. Um, and then... Uh, went through a selection program and, and went to another place. So I continued doing that same particular job, just with different folks. Uh, and then the latter end of my time there, we started transitioning into other things. And uh, I spent my last uh, six, five, six years as a reconnaissance team leader and got really into all that stuff, long range shooting and stocking and all that hiding and whatever hiding in plain sight or hiding in a bush whatever it is uh, got really into that shit so all righty so l let me ask this question first before we get too far into the meat of the subject um is it is is being an air force cool guy now the coolest of cool guys are we still doing the the uh military special operations hierarchy fact sheet I, I couldn't tell you like if you if you're out, i mean you, you should know if you're out of the business for like six months like you're so far behind you know culturally technology wise and all that stuff like you have no idea um i certainly enjoyed my job i got to you know i got the the benefits of everything working with army navy marines and all that stuff uh and nobody knows who you really work for which is awesome the air force thinks that you're working with the army the army thinks that you're under the air force and you just kind of you know, if you want, you can just kind of disappear and just do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, like I want to do that, some of that training or no, I got Air Force things to do or whatever. So, yeah, I enjoyed it. Yeah, I uh, when we worked with our JTACs, I always imagined that they had some sort of preeminent amount of freedom. And I was always kind of confused at who they were for or I was confused at who they were for multiple years. Of course, you're because I got into Ranger Battalion at like 19 years old, like a lot of us young people. And it's just you're trying to figure out everything over here on how the platoon team structure works and how all this kind of stuff. And then you got another guy who's wearing a different uniform who's attached to you. And you're like, what do you do? But yeah, you're always okay. with it. Yeah, well, of course, <laughs> and you know, it's, it's, it's just it's when uh, perhaps people getting into the military now will have so much better. Um, I, I will no, not perhaps. I know for absolute certain people who are getting into the military now, well, will will have will have had so many more opportunities to understand some of the basic structures that come to like the sp basic social constructs and structures mm -hmm. that come to uh, that exist within Ranger Battalion or even Special Operations units than we did when I got in because the internet was not nearly as thorough at that time. And so it's interesting to see, and, and I think that's actually for the better. As much as the, the special operations world has to deal with a certain level of secrecy, it's interesting that we're figuring out which parts need to be quiet and which parts need to be loud. So yeah, for sure. And I talked about that before as well. Like the the whole if I if I tell you I have to kill you kind of thing is is lunacy. I mean, we're we're just not we're not going to talk about methods. We're not going to talk about names or places. That's it. Like all the other stuff, I can tell you all kinds of stories. I might leave out like where it was or who was involved kind of thing, but uh, you can certainly talk about operations and shit. And, and uh, which is interesting, it, I, I still have buddies that are still in and they're seeing a change with what you're just talking about, how they better understand uh, you know, the hierarchy and all that stuff that's in the community uh, within SOF and everything. And so they kind of come in with like, I already know what's going on. You know, I really don't need uh, to earn my way or learn my way into this thing. Uh, and they had to, you know, the older guys really had to really smash that, like, stop, just stop. Like, you don't know. Like, you've, you've heard, you, you've read Reddit or whatever it is, like, but you have no idea. Um, and maybe that's an exaggeration. They probably have a good idea. I've seen some shit on Reddit where it's like, wow, okay, um, that's not good, but whatever. Uh, but yeah, there is an attitude. There is kind of an attitude coming in 
uh, generally speaking with the newer folks that, uh, you know, I, I got my beret or whatever it is. And now I deserve my place here. I'm like now nah, you still, you're continuously trying to earn your place there. Yeah. I think that mentality will never change because of the nature of the job. It's sort of like, I mean, let's take the, let's take the world outside of, um, let's take the world outside of the military and, and what we're talking about now and where, where you and I are kind of lo located now and what you'd refer to as like the greater gun culture is that, mm -hmm. You know, you're you're although it's not the same in the sense of there isn't the immediacy and potentiality of danger that is attached to like deployments and military time uh, as far as relevancy or participation, you fall off in certain platforms and certain people's way of doing business. You miss a week. You fall off the radar for a long time. Yeah. Whereas and I, and I don't think that that it, that it is. I don't think that me, what I'm saying in that sense is that I, it's not so much a criticism of it, but like we're not eternal. We're human beings. We, we, we have our time in the sun and then we go away. And the and, and, and in the military side of things, especially because I remember the same, exact same words, you have to prove that you belong here every day in Ranger Battalion sounded really cruel at first it really did especially because we my selection process was kind of a fake one to be honest um and then after that we after that you get you get into battalion and you know your team leaders like you have to prove yourself every day which sounds a little bit cruel at the in at the onset um but what it ended up doing and what the the value of it is is it's just the reality like is, as soon as you stop trying to be good at being in ranger battalion you get really bad really quickly as soon as you stop trying to participate in this community and you just leave it alone and you go off and do something else you're gonna you know things change so quickly i took i took a three-year break from anything related to gun culture and by the time i came back I had Pharaoh had concepts came into existence. Spiritist systems came in. Like I literally left at the DD two fourteen. I'm sorry. I stepped out. Um, I stepped out of gun culture with a Mark eighteen with a quad rail. And when by the time I came back, three years later, it was like the world was just so different, and it was quite funny. So yeah, for sure. and, and quite honestly, like at a basic level, get out of the military stuff. Um, my, one of my favorite quotes is it's I, it's better to be trusted than to be loved or I'd rather be trusted than be loved or whatever. But you have to earn that shit every day. You can't just like gain someone's trust and then just kind of whatever. I got it. So now I don't have to do anything about it. No, you got to you got to work on that shit every day as well. So it, it's back to what you said. If you're just kind of you reach a point where you think it's it's all good and you just kind of like I did it. I don't have to do anything more to earn whatever this is, trust or my spot or whatever this is. It, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna flake off, and people are gonna be like, "Well, fuck that guy," and you're and you're just not gonna be as good of an operator or as good of a person, whatever that is, if you're not constantly trying to be that that good person or that great operator. It's a, that's a really cool take on Machiavelli because although he's he, he's really taken out of context quite oftentimes because he says it's it's better to be feared than to be loved. But that's not really the whole quote. The uh, the the con. Have, are you have you read the Prince? I haven't. No, neither. I haven't finished it, but I've read I've read uh you know excerpts and elements of it. But the argument, or the the statement that Machiavelli, if I recall correctly, that he's making about it's better to be feared than to be loved, begins with the predicate that if you cannot be both. It is better to be feared than to be loved. But the the goal would always to be both feared and loved. As a, he's talking about as a ruler, so right. I mean, and then all, you could also make some criticisms towards Machiavelli because I think the end of life of that prince he was writing to wasn't that great. I think he died rather violently. Yeah, well, go out like a champ, or go out in your sleep. <coughs> <coughs> coffee down the road too uh yeah these violent delights come to violent ends i think that's uh from something else <laughs> but yeah so i reached so you made a statement maybe a month ago on social media this is kind of what led to our second conversation and you were talking about the <coughs> vetting of instructors and what i wanted to do is what i wanted to do in today's conversation is i wanted to focus on 
sort of fleshing out that conversation a little bit when it comes to how would, what are some things that you would recommend from basic to advanced when you're talking to somebody and somebody's interested in 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 in, in instruction being instructed there will be, you know we, we've already overcome the basics as far as you know assume the student is responsible well behaved well well equipped enough to accomplish these you know whatever you think but if they're try they're looking at the instructor world and maybe they have a little bit of skepticism because of the prevalence or the presence of various um stolen valor type peoples or the 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 social media drama between military and citizens which kind of is artificial and kind of is you know perennial um how would you how would what what are some of the what is some of the advice that you'd give to somebody who's looking at receiving instruction um on of and and how they would like vet an instructor i think it's very i mean it's going to be a cop out answer but it's very very basic um it getting back to the trust, like I, I got to be able to trust this guy. I'm trusting him with my money and trusting him with my time, etc. If I'm asking him, you know, basic or even advanced questions online, whichever it is, like if, if he's on Instagram or if he has a website, I can email him and you're getting very generic answers or you're not getting answers at all. And the answer is you have to take my class. I think that's a fucking huge warning. That's a huge ticket right there. Like, <clears throat> the product itself should should just sell, you know, like if I'm speaking correctly and what we're talking about from based off of your questions or if I'm just putting out free information or whatever, <clears throat> that sells itself for the class that you're teaching. And I shouldn't hold anything back. Like Mike and I, when we, when we teach our distance carving stuff and long range stuff, like everything you learn in the class, you can ask us. Like you, you don't have to come to the class. The, the class allows us to go more in depth with things. Cause there's only so many characters I can fucking type before we start getting ADHD and, and looking away from what we're reading. Um, but there's benefits to going to the class cause you can actually engage in what it is we're, we're talking about <clears throat> and we can give you hands-on corrections, whatever the fuck. But regardless, like if we're talking either over the phone or email or through Instagram or whatever, it, it should be open conversation. I shouldn't hold anything back. And I, sh I shouldn't, <clears throat> I shouldn't just give you a generic answer that leads to more questions. Uh, and I certainly fucking should not tell you to just go to a class. Uh, that, that right. I mean that right there immediately, like I am never going to that guy's class, unfortunately, like maybe he has some tidbits that, that I could learn from whether they're negative or positive, you know, what have you. But as soon as I hear that, like, yeah, that, that is not a genuine guy, sorry, or gal, whatever. We can't discriminate. Uh, it makes sense. I think most most of the instructors that we've seen, uh, the last time I think I asked this question to was to Duffy um, of Kinetic Consulting. Good dude. He, yep, solid guy. And we started talking about, this is a long time now, I think it was an episode in the teens, but he, we we're starting to talk about like what are the single most important aspects of an instructor. And for me, one of them that continues to stand out is integrity in the sense of it's it, it's not i hope it doesn't sound as much of a or i hope it doesn't sound uh, i can't say it that way either uh but integrity what integrity means to me in regards to an instructor is that the instructor is capable of doing what he's instructing and he's he's capable of doing it he does the hard work outside of the class and so that when he comes to the class he's not necessarily coasting but he has he has the mental aperture open enough because of practice to focus on what the students need as opposed to being concerned about whether or not he's going to even perform the thing that he's supposed to be teaching well enough not to be memed out of the internet. And <clears throat> so that is one side of integrity. And then the other side of integrity is, you know, teaching genuine material as opposed to hacks and switches and little, little kind of things that, you know, that are really more focused on criticizing other people than anything else. I mean, yeah, for sure. You, you got to be uh, a somewhat of an expert of what you're talking about. Um, I, I don't want to go too far to say it, it really depends, but experience does matter. And then sometimes experience doesn't matter <clears throat> in regards to world, real world stuff. You know, when it comes to shooting specifically, like you don't have to kill anybody to, to know how to shoot. I mean, that's just 
ridiculous. So when people talk about like, well, do it in combat and like, well, I'm just talking about the fundamentals of shooting and, and ballistics and then shit. I, I don't need to, I don't need to go to combat to figure that out. Um, you, you can take this thing and put it in this scenario and then teach this kind of course if you want, but the, the two don't have to be necessarily related. So having experience in what it is you're talking about specifically, not generically, or being a subject matter expert on it, uh, that goes a long way. <laughs> you can't you can't just get in the game because you like it. Um, you really need to be sound in what it is you're teaching so that when you get that very specific, ridiculous question, you have an answer for it. Do you think people join the military? Ah, oh, that's too broad of a question. Do you think people join the military specifically for the goal of saying I went to combat so they could be an instructor? That seems like very a very thorough plan for an 18-year-old. I mean, it, I, we're weird, man. So I'm sure there's I'm sure every excuse has been hit for joining the military. We, we sure. America's been at war for a long time. Humans have been at war for a long time and whether it's glory in the battlefield or glory in the Instagram clout, you know, like I'm sure I'm sure one of those have been hit multiple times. Yeah, it'll it, it'll when the the idea of Instagram clout starts to circle back into being genuine, that'll be an interesting feeling. I don't even know how to think about it other than you know, the, this idea of glory in battle is is such a old I think it's returning in a little bit of a sense because of the death of the or the dying off of kind of the anti-hero cynicism of the 90s in the early yeah. 2000s because I, I think that mentality is kind of falling apart. I mean, basically, you know, I'm going to be a little over the top on this one and, and, and people who know who me might recognize it as being a little bit of jaded, but like the Marvel Cinematic Universe is basically a construction of anti-heroes with a few with exceptions who in some way shape or form you know have well it's not entirely but it's it feels like it's become something like that and it's also it's it's taken that that shtick gone so far that it no longer has value anymore and i and i'll have to work on some material because i've been i'll have to put it out this is a preview for those who are listening fine uh on just the issues of the anti-hero but so the the but the the perspective of war has been this idea of like war is hell and there is no glory in battle anymore and sometimes i wonder how how much of a paradigm that is and how much of it will be shifting because i it's such a it's it's not that it's not ugly it's there's something there i think we're missing the part i'm i'm i know i'm stumbling through it because this is a difficult subject no, I'm I'm uh I'm appreciative of the fact that people are losing the sight of glory in battle and coming to the conclusion that it's it's absolutely fucking stupid what we're doing, uh, and that we we base a lot of our technology on how to uh, more creatively kill people, and it's I'm I'm glad it's happening. I'm glad that these fucking people are like, look at Ukraine. This is disgusting. I'm glad that it's all visual. Everyone can see. Um, that there's no like, uh, you know, lieutenant charging with his fucking saber and all his men are following him and there's some glorious music going on in the background. No, it's it's devastating. It's uh, horrific and it's, you know, an absolute crime against humanity. I know it's a cliche, I guess, but uh, it's fucking dumb. And there's still there's still, you know, you still get a sense when you're in the military that a lot of officers who come from academies and such still have that mentality. Like they read too many books kind of thing. Like the you know being an officer is so prestigious and leading men into battle and and death and all this stuff. There's there's still an amount of honor in that and like, man, killing people is, you know, it, I I don't see any honor in that whatsoever. I see the honor in like standing up for those who are weak or those who are helpless or or uh, helping you know innocents or whatever it is. There's honor in that for sure, but <clears throat> and that might entail killing evil people, sure, but that's not where the honor comes from, it comes from standing up for those who, who can't, the innocent, the good, whatever. We're about to open a big can of worms. Oh, I know. That people people want to hear it. They, they want to justify the last 20 years of their life that they committed to, and I get it. I get it. Uh, but yeah, that, that I, I understand that as part. 
because you've invested so much time into it, you have to say what for. Yeah. And that and that's a heavy question. You can't just, you know, it's 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 not it's not the it, that is not the in a in a question exclusive to those who have committed to lesser things. No, and it's, and it's a very personal. It's a it's a personal question because my my take on it won't simulate the other millions of people who ever served. It's it's my genuine, my personal, my specific opinion, and it's going to be different for other experiences. So, no one's wrong, no one's right. Well, we can, we so we can dehumanize each other in war very quickly. But and so you are making a criticism of officers who read too much, and I think, in my opinion, I, I'll disagree with you first. I think it's officers who read too little, um, or or read uh, only specific type things, and not yeah, yeah. that the, they're not able to they or they they refuse to. It's not that they're not able to; they refuse to ar- ar- articulate and develop a understanding of the moral components it's kind of like silicon valley they never asked if they should they only asked if they could kind of problem the the, the similar joke around ai is that the, the people who are building ai are, are diving headlong into a problem that could very well bring about the end of the world and this is all sort of in in snippets so don't at me about it but it but the the point is that they're trying to figure out if they can build the thing whether or not they should Instead of asking whether or not they should, and that goes back to the question of war, is, I, is in some sense I think the only people who think that war is glory in the in the cartoon sense are the people who have no affiliation to it. They have no consequences and no participation. Uh, but those are oftentimes the same people who swing and oscillate back and forth, like a you know with like with the rapidity of a sewing machine. Between war is. Um, War is an atrocity and war is glory. You think about it, it's the anti-war party or the anti-war people who are criticizing the Afghan and uh, uh, and Iraqi war for years as saying things like war is a racket, it never means anything. But as soon as Ukraine kicks off, they're right there for it and they support it immediately and there's no con- constant or continu- continuity between the two. Um I think I, I, I want to dig in deeper to this idea of like war having no honor. There's no honor in killing people because my most common observation of it is that uh, two things are two things are are conflated really quickly. One of them is a sense of jaded uh, disappointment is oftentimes mistaken as a sign of experience, and then the other one is. The naivety that causes, uh, usually causes more death than anything else, is coming at a distance. I know those two aren't very clearly spoken, but I'll work it out through this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Allergies. Woo. I mean, again, like I, I can't say that uh, that war won't happen or that you know people won't die, but that's not the that's not the reason or the uh, that's not the uh, why honor exists kind of thing, I guess. Um, honor it's, only it's exists there. between honorable men. There, you can't, you cannot foment honor among dishonorable men. You just can't. Right. They don't have it. And so, how do you keep like that moral high ground in a place like the trenches of Ukraine? You know, where you're going to get, you're going to get face to face with somebody. Somebody is probably just like you. Um, and the only differences you have is that. His boss told he told him he had to be there, and your boss told him that he can't be there. Is that oversimplifying it? I Very just, much, it's, yeah. Like it, it's really difficult to it's really difficult to to oversimplify anything humanistic. Like it, you know, we're we're fucking complicated. We're emotional. We're squishy. Uh, we complain a lot. Uh, we are individuals. There's no one like me on this planet, at least. We can get into that, I guess. Uh, but you know, how how do we even define that word honor with you know billions of people on this planet, uh, with individual different experiences, with different types of war, with the, it, different kind of social constructs? It, it's so ridiculously crazy uh, to define what 
something honorable is or whatever. Uh, you know, I can only take my personal experiences and, and tell you what I think it is. And then I can be judged for that. And uh, people can agree or disagree, whatever it is. And maybe I leave out some specifics. So I do look good or, you know, maybe I get too in detailed, but I'm not able to properly explain my specific situation in there. And you see it a lot of times with movies when they depict, you know, uh, real world situations and combat stuff. They they have to add a lot of things in order for you to understand the kind of pressures that that person is under and why they made those fucking decisions. Even though that thing may that thing may have taken like days to get to. But you know, we don't have days in the movie theater. We got to get them right now. Yeah, the I mean, film is still an adaptation and, and good film is able to convey the concept and the idea and in some cases the feeling of a if it's trying to recreate a a scenario, something that or a historical or historical or even pseudo historical event. Um, or if it's trying to make an argument is like a piece of literature would do so. I want to stick on the subject of war being war and violence or war being a racket in some sense, because I, I, I'm, I, I've, I've run into kind of a matrix of thoughts on this subject. And what I mean by matrix is not like the movie, but more like a, a spreadsheet of cross intersecting con uh, ideas. One of them is the idea that you hear war is a racket. And certainly as the world uh, that we live in has both moved towards globalization, whether you call that good or bad, it's inevitable in the sense of we're better at trading, better at interacting internet from, or from internet to, to, to ships, to shipping, to whatever, you know, the world has gotten small, but then also we've gotten, you know, more and more populated. And in the same way that the American governing system might be in some sense, instead of looking at it as just corrupt, but buckling under the population size and density and variation, which is a little bit more of maybe, which is a little bit less of a person versus person perspective than a general system perspective. War itself goes back, uh, the, the idea that I see in war is that it loses any sense of honor when dishonorable people are allowed to control the reins of what happens where we've seen a couple of these clips come out and these and we've seen more than a couple we've seen thousands of hours now of conversations confessions explanations from people whose job it was whether through government or higher military to make decisions in regards to what happens where and those people are talking about it either with the trivialness that they had no real conscience about what was happening or that they didn't know. Like, for example, the early on in the war, in the global war on terror, there was this, uh, I saw a, just a, just a short snippet, and I don't even know, you know whether or not, I had to have to verify it more and more and more, but it's that there was an intent to like invade five countries. I know what you're talking about, yeah, and it names the ones that we have been invading specifically. Mm -hmm. Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, Somalia, and then there were—I think there were a few more, but Iran was the fifth. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I Iran. Iran was the fifth, uh, the last country. Um, which I mean, it make it makes sense for American interests. Let's not be foolish here. Um, but I, I think I, I come back to the issue of juice. You, the, uh, the, the juice ad bello or juice ad bellum, ju juice in bello argument idea of like there's a difference between the justification for war, just war theory, and then just actions in war. And, I, and, and when it comes to the individual, we're spending so much. I think it should. At what point in time do you think the individual should, should shift from focusing on their own actions and their, their, their own justification and and at just actions in war and start looking at the higher level, like the just justifications for war. When do you think, how do you think someone accomplishes that successfully? I don't know. Like it, as an individual who's involved in it, I don't think you can do that. Um, you know, you, you got to survive in that shit. And you can't be thinking about the bigger picture. Uh, if you're aloof in your foxhole, which, you know, I've never been in a foxhole, whatever, but 
if you're aloof in your foxhole thinking about, you know, why uh, you're going to question what you're going to do right then and there. And that could cost your life or your buddy's life or whatever. Um, so you're very much in the moment if, if you're involved in that thing. Uh, and that's where I believe, you know, uh, the common citizen of said country, I think that's their responsibility to hold their government accountable uh, for what it is they're doing for the bigger picture, which I think has been going on. Uh, it's just the government is very successful at, you know, hiding those things or justifying those things um, or distracting those things like, no, 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 don't worry about that. Look at look at this. Look, Bud Light is making bad commercials or, or whatever it is. Uh, so we get distracted by the the overall why. Um, but yeah, like the individual involved, I don't think they can get too much involved, even at the mid-grade, you know, levels of folks, uh, because they're just going to kick you out anyway if, if you get too silly with it. I don't think it can make a difference in there. I think it's very much, yeah, I think it's very much uh, on, on the, uh, you know, state governments or in the people and themselves to, to hold the government accountable for what the fuck we're doing over there. You've reached silly goose status. You are no longer allowed to serve in the military. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You said too much. Uh, off of this head. Yeet. My grandfather used to talk about how uh, when he was in Korea, um, if they had somebody who was in charge, who was making bad decisions and some of those bad decisions he, the way that he talked about it usually implied some sort of moral failing. It wasn't like, you know, he made mistakes as far as so I, I, I'd have to go back into it. Cause at some point in time when you're in, in war, the difference between an honest mistake and a, and a dishonest mistake is still that people die. And so there is the relevancy of whether it was intentional or unintentional takes us a backseat to what is the consequence metaphorically if you give a kid a lightsaber and they're swinging that swinging it at around at some point in time it doesn't matter whether that kid is malicious or ignorant he's causing pain death and suffering and destruction and something right. has to be done about it uh, but my grandfather talks about how when they would have form forms of leadership who were uh, let's just say doing leading in such a way as to cause detriment to the lives of the people that they were in charge of uh, when they would engage in a gunfight, somebody would usually run over to that person in charge and just shoot him in the back of the head. <laughs> it's a very different time, very, very, very different time. <laughs> but it was an in, it, it, and so that's you know, and, and 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 so that that way of acting at that was capable of happening at that time because of the measure and the scale of war that they're engaged in according to his description, as well as, you know, forensics weren't the same when you were dealing with that scale of war as opposed to what went on in the global war of terror. I mean, more people would perish in a season or a year in that conflict than we did in the 20 years of being in Afghanistan. And so it's not, it's a bit, it's a bit of a different story. Although, well, yeah, new, numerical perishing isn't exactly you know a one for one but yeah i was understand that <clears throat> a lot of those guys were world war ii vets and they they knew the fucking game uh you get some some bright-eyed bushy-tailed lieutenant coming in with some seasoned you know staff sergeant and he's like man I, I know this music and we're we're doing stupid fucking mistakes and you know hey the guy went to West Point, he knows what he's talking about. He studied. He studied World War II. The other guy was in it, and maybe they just you know on their wits end. They're like, I'm not doing this shit again. Like I'm not falling for this again. Uh, I'm going to get through this thing. So, not that I justify killing Americans whatsoever, but you know, uh, I could see where that would come from in that case. No, that, that's just one perspective. I'm sure there's like a million different ones. Like I just don't like the guy or whatever. Yeah, I mean, there's to to be clear on this one. It's you know, it was um, you know, it it was the story of my a story my grandfather told when I was young, and there were multiple other stories. He 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 had the attitude going into Korea that you would kind of uh, I, and and given this is all in retrospect, but it's also like a man telling a story to his family. Um, 
there was some serious main character energy if you know the reference if you know right. the reference you know he he saw a lot of the issues that were going on with on on, on let's just say the the squad platoon squad and platoon level um and sort of div, deviated and devised ways around it according to his stories uh but he was ultimately a, a pow for three years in korea oh great that's yeah. the, one of the worst places to do it he survived though he survived he you know and that's a but but and so um looking at you know like looking at the, the of all the literature that i've read that has to do with how we think of war you know st strangely enough um you run into very i need to read more for sure but i've run into very few accounts of the war very few accounts that and very few arguments that really ex really try to explain it thoroughly and some of those things happen ancillary they're connected to it but not the same uh i've brought it up nicholas nassim taleb's book skin in the game has brought the idea brought the idea to me that would later be spoken of by jocko willink and probably the timeline of the two books being published might be inverted i don't i don't remember um but i read skin in the game first and then if i remember right in in that one i i understood that this is where we get the idea of the nco is that 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 person has the ability the wisdom and the experience to make a decision on the field but he's also there to be to make the decision like his decision have has immediate consequences to him by having that skin in the game not only does he make wiser decisions but i would make the argument that he makes more moral decisions whereas the further you get disconnected from the consequences of those decisions whether juristic or whether in forms of justice or just simply uh, action and consequence of, of violence uh the less likely or the less feedback you have the less participation you have in making a valuable decision if there's no consequences what uh, for your decision you're going to make a diff you're or it, you're going to have less tangible control feedback at that decision does that does that make sense yeah i mean you're you're seeing just look back at you know way back in the day horses and arrows and stuff and commanders are on the ground now what's interesting when i as i'm you're saying that i'm thinking about it, like they did a lot more in our regards looking back at it, a lot more immoral things with the commanders on the ground but there but as in a sense of protecting their own men to do it and now as you see like as commanders get pulled off they're doing their commanders are doing the moral right thing towards you know the enemy or whatever at the sacrifice of their men so you know we saw that all the time like we we would get hit we'd had a call for aircraft and we wouldn't be allowed to drop because it was uh, you know two kilometers within the border of pakistan and we're getting our asses handed to us and they're on the high ground et cetera, et cetera. so they're making the moral and, and the legal legally right decision i guess at the cost of us whereas back then they were war willing to do again in our perspective now in the uh, modern west whatever they're doing the more immoral thing towards their enemy but you know for their people kind of thing so yeah i don't know if that relates to, but that was interesting as you were saying that i was thinking about that um but yeah the, the more and more we pull off <clears throat> and this even gets into not just commanders but people themselves and we're just letting robots kill each other um we're seeing it now is you know a guy missing missing a limb by himself on a in a trench line like he's gonna die why do you need to drop another fucking mortar on the guy kind of thing but uh yeah like that was my personal experience with with being on there is that the commanders are trying to do the moral thing but at the cost of us so like i don't does that count as i like balance each other back out you know like this is moral but me leaving my guys there to fend for themselves you know, like is that moral and now we're back in the middle now we're in the gray man again yeah the uh one thing that war does not afford the man is the convenience of easy decisions no, no. Uh, and there's never a, <clears throat> there's never a right decision. There's only a less wrong that's going to let you live. I might disagree with you there, but only in principle. <laughs> um, I might I might disagree with you there only in principle. The 
there is still a right thing to do. And and this is where it goes into how do you think about something being moral? What is your moral code? This is this is kind of you, what you're doing is you're hitting at the you know something that I think is or something that I know is at the core of of why I wanted to talk to you is 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 how do we think about morality especially in a dynamic environment? And there's always the criticism that comes back. It's it's easy to be you know, uh, it's easy to be it's easy to get trapped in navel gazing, ivory tower contemplations on morality when there are no consequences to your actions. But when you have those things in front of you, when what you believe, let's just take even like um, uh, Christianity in early Rome. There's uh, various accounts of how Christianity was persecuted by the early Roman or by the Roman empire at the time and one of the things that i learned through reading history was that it wasn't continuous it was sort of like in these massive surges you would have 20 years of general like peace let's call it and then all of a sudden an emperor or, or an individual in an area would choose to persecute the christians to the extent of death and that would go on for two three ten years and then it would subside and then it would it happen again and then it would subside and it was a there's a book called the lapsed by saint cyprian who tries to deal with the moral problem of what do they do with the people who are only christians in the times where there is no persecution but as soon as the persecution happens they sort of slough it off or they 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 hide it out of fear and he i think he does a pretty good job I, when i say that it sounds so trivial i'm reading somebody who's for, their writing is like almost two thousand years old i'm like oh, you did okay you know it's like seven out of ten uh <laughs> it's kind of kind of arrogant but i think he he does in in, in the labs did, he does a pretty interesting job uh trying to be thorough in his assessment and recognizing that not all people are of strong will and not all people are of strong character and then there are these other kind of parts to it and so it, it kind of comes to the same way what we when we started a conversation on instructors and, and vetting instructors and now we're here talking about you know, not not everyone is not everyone is cut out for the difficulty the difficult moral decisions made in war that's for sure no absolutely some people just don't have it they can't balance they can't live on that balance of on the one hand being very 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 aware of the moral consequences of your actions my observation and maybe my predicate would be that the guy who thinks that reduces war into some sort of brutish hollywood killing um is too simplistic to even have a place there he doesn't have any he it's a it's a caricature of a caricature at that point in time i think yeah you know, there's people that would that would rather die than than make any kind of decision uh, under that kind of pressure. They would just rather die. Yep. Just be that that collapse star. Yeah, what did you call it? The collapsing star. You know, they're bright and shiny, and uh, you know, mommy told them that they were the best in the world or whatever. Uh, they make good decisions and blah, blah blah. And you put them in that kind of significant. I mean, it's nothing to to kind of brush off or whatever, but that kind of horrific pressure uh and then all of a sudden their world comes collapsing in and they realize like holy shit i am a lot smaller in this world than i thought i was and now this this catastrophic ridiculous thing is going on around me and i'd rather just kind of collapse and go away what about the uh what about the caricature of the jaded veteran who just chooses violence for all solutions he, he may not even <laughs> be uh... ridiculous yeah, like I, I, I don't see that. I don't see that in reality either. No, like uh, we've lost this art of communication with people. It's, it's, it's super. So that's your like that's your number one go to. Just talk to the fucking guy. Even the guys insulting or whatever, like just talk to them. Who fucking knows what they're going through, uh, where they are in their life, and who who's to say that you haven't been there as well? Uh, I, I just I, I lose my mind when it just goes to like I would have punched that guy's lights out. Like where do we go from there? Like. You're going to do this in front of your kids. You're going to do this in public. You're going to potentially like 
crack his skull in the concrete and now you're going to like it's so dumb to go straight to that fucking route like just shut up quit 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 with the stupid uh you know violence first or whatever this shit is and like learn to learn to re-engage with people again learn to be uh sympathetic and empathetic and and uh patient and all this other shit not shit really good stuff yeah well i, I call it a caricature because i don't know if i've really seen it in the real world i've seen <sighs> i mean i I've seen people I've seen try people, to, yeah, try to type it out that way, but I don't know if I've ever seen it. Yeah, yeah, I've seen people try to, yeah, I, it's kind of like the. Um, I'm going to make as uh, an observation, and uh, I want to. Uh, I'll see what you think about it. Every almost to the to the extent this is not absolute, but to to it's a, it's a, it's enough where it's a generalization. Most, if not every, veteran individual who I've met who has it, it displayed that sort of hyper vigilance that is very very performative the i always keep my back to the wall check the doors all this kind of stuff like he's very 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 over the top about it he's talking to you about it you you know you you've known him for 5 minutes and you already know that he was a uh, you know he and he said his you know where he's at and all this kind of stuff and he's the, the, the over the over the top hyper vigilant guy you know what i'm talking about yeah he's, you know sure. uh, t- uh, t- almost to a man they've turned out to be a fraud Every, you're saying like everyone that you've talked to like that they have not yeah not, not i'm not saying every single one i'm saying that the people who have made it their personality gotcha you know there's the thing like i've seen people who have exhibited hypervigilance in the in the sense of like bouts of it you know what i mean like it just kind of i've seen it happen to people i've seen people go into it and come out of it but the people who have like internalized it and made it their identity they almost, almost to a man, turn out to be a fraud. It's, it's, it's like it's very Steven Seagal. Oh yeah. To be, you know, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm hyper vigilant. I, you know, I, it's like, oh yeah, dude. Uh, you were never in a gunfight. You were in the navy. You were on a boat. You're, You're not hyper vigilant. Lowly, lowly cook. It doesn't matter what you were in your job. Like this is not a criticism of you saying, oh, you weren't a Navy SEAL. You weren't cool enough. That's not at all. Like. Anyone, I mean, most of us who've been in the military know that there is a difference between combat MOSs and non combat MOSs in the sense that you're still people, we understand it, but like just don't step out of your bounds kind of thing. Like don't, 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 don't assert operator status or whatever you want to call it. But the people who I've observed in, 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 uh, as being a veteran who have exhibited the character, the, who have internalized this idea of hyper vigilance. Uh, almost to a man are, are are just an absolute fraud. You find out that their military career was essentially a one failure after another. They're referred to as a coward. They never actually did anything, whatever it is. And that these are hard words to say to somebody. Um, but I, I very rarely, if any ever, that I can think of right now, met somebody who had genuine experience, who exhibited the trait of hypervigilance as an internal personality type. I mean, I, I, I have and probably still do occasionally experience hypervigilance, but I see it as a crutch. Like, I, it, it distracts me from what is more important. You know, um, th- there, there was a time when, you know, my wife wanted to take the whole family to Europe and do a thing. It's like, I can't. I wouldn't be able to do that. I would be so overwhelmed and distracted at trying to, you know, protect the family the whole time. Where's, where's so-and-so where are they at? Where, you know, I can't do that. It's like, I'll take you. Cause I can, I can manage you. I can't manage five of us. Um, so that, that stuff is real. I, I think majority of guys that, uh, that have been doing it for a long time, wish that it would just go the fuck away for the most part. Uh, maybe a little bit here and there, you know, you don't want to be, uh, you know, a duck walking down the middle of the road, just fucking aloof about everything going on around you. Um, you know, and that kind of like, like, that goes against the whole, uh, that kind of goes against the whole tactic itself anyways. Like, why are you discussing your, your, your secrets about protecting yourself to anyone? Like you, you don't, don't talk about that shit. Don't, don't tell people why you're doing certain things publicly. Uh, and then like, yeah, okay. I found uh, you're doing all those things. Well, I know you're not doing that thing then. So I know how to, I know how to get around you. Because Pretty it's a performance. Shit. It's a it's a performance. It's not it's not genuine. 
it goes back to the question that started this thing off as in how do you vet an instructor are they perform are they are they a, a dancing bear or are they genuine <laughs> yeah i i think a lot of the a lot of the great instructors are just you know walking around and whatever fucking blue jeans they've had for the last 10 years and whatever free t-shirts someone gave them and flip-flops or maybe maybe a pair of shoes and just spouting out shit that they know about and the other guys are got you know they're multi-cam head to toe even though they're the instructor and i, I don't know i can't it's you can see like man what are you doing like you're, you're here to teach me you know this thing like why are you getting in the stack and what are you doing shit? <laughs> Yeah, I, I I I've had the opportunity to stud, to train with multiple people, quite a, quite a, quite a quite a variety, and um, you know, it doesn't it's not it doesn't bother me at all. I don't think it should bother someone the that when an instructor is wearing gear, whatever, you know. He, yeah, it just he depends on the training. If it's a performance based training and he has to demonstrate, then yeah, absolutely, he needs to be able to show like. Look, I'm big and bulky, and I can get through that door. So should you. Mm -hmm. uh, so it just depends on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it's been an interesting consistency uh, when it comes to training. <sighs> well, we're gonna have to. We're, I, I think we're if we're gonna try to get into another topic, we're gonna end up getting into a long topic. And I know you're kind of short <laughs> today, but well, let's. Um, what is some what is there a piece of advice you'd like to leave the audience with as as we're kind of signing off for a shorter earlier episode today yeah i mean uh in regards to like betting and stuff it, at the end of the day it's it's pretty difficult there when it comes to certain individuals there's there's people that are really good at staying in the shadows and um and uh you know not getting called out the good thing about that stuff is that if people don't know that guy understand that like if they're coming from law enforcement or military background we'll, we'll put that out there uh somebody knows that guy period and they can either confirm what he's saying or tell you like i have never heard of this guy before which is you know kind of some alarm bells right there uh, if you have been in soft someone fucking knows you and they can you know that if nobody knows that guy there's a dinger right there like there's something wrong if somebody does know that guy, they can tell you exactly where that guy came from and what they did. Unfortunately for us, is I think there has to be some sacrificial lambs there, you know, guys that go to the course and hear what they're saying and all that stuff. Um, but, you know, they're, they're going to get caught. They're going to get sought out. Uh, I would say try not to go to courses for the experience. I've had some folks ask me, like, should I go to this guy's course? Really high profile dude. And I was like, man, to be honest, like, I, I don't know about his course, but I can tell you that you can get other people who are completely vetted in what they do for way cheaper. You're, you're going to that that one course for the experience, for the, the figurehead. And that's what you're paying for. Like, save your money, dude. You'll get maybe even better training going to this guy who, who was a professional for many, many years and knows what he's talking about for way fucking less. You don't have to pay for whatever company he's working for, uh, you know, to promote whatever the fuck. So it does take a team effort to get all this shit done. And in the end of the day, like it, it, it sounds like a you know, very generic way of how to figure people out, but it takes a, a group of folks to actually vet this one individual. Um, and it sucks that we have to get to that point. It sucks that, uh, we have to kind of like eat our own, but you know, if we want to make this, uh, if we want to keep this a pure, uh, you know, justification for our movement as a people, we got to be able to call out the horse shit and the ones that are bringing us down. You know, lying is, is not going to cut it. Lying is, is a trait within our group of folks. It's just not something that we can, we can allow. Um, we got to maintain that moral high ground. Yeah. I think one of the best examples that I've seen for understanding gun culture which is a little vague, and it will always be vague. Um, one of the best examples that I can describe for describe to, 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 for determining gun culture as a whole is that the the world that we live in is a dignity world. It's a world of dignity. Everyone has it. Well, unless they get unless they forsake it or they 
forego it is probably another word. But uh, but gun culture itself is an honor culture. There's no free lunch. You have to you have to be you have to work your way in. Um, and you can lose you can do you can do things that are dishonorable and 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 find your yourself on the way out really quickly. And so, by thinking of it that way, by by if we think of it that way, you know there is no. You have a right to bear arms, but you will not. You do. You do not have the right induction into gun culture that has to be earned, and there isn't exactly a clear pathway to what that looks like. Although there are some that are clearer than others, like military service tends to be a good one. Um, and so, yeah, that's where the lying comes in. Lying is a dishonorable action, and it will find you. It will it'll place you on the outside of our, our out, out out of the the light of the campfire, if you're going to use fire in the dark by Donovan as a metaphor. No, yeah, I mean it's it's super silly. Like guys, you don't need to to have this massive, uh, you know, profile to get into this thing. It, it, no, nobody really cares in that sense. Like there's been plenty of uh, great ideas coming from, you know, lack of a better term, from nobodies. They come into this and like, hey, you know, I've seen this perspective and people are like, holy shit, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so come in open minded uh, and ready to fucking eat. Let's do this thing. Don't need to lie about your background. Uh, it's super, super fucking silly. Short term gains yeah, for long term losses. Yeah, for sure. This is a long, long term game, man. Like um, you don't have to reach the top right fucking now. Which we can get into that whole cultural thing right now. We're owed the top, you know. We don't have to work for it, but whatever. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Just be a normal dude or chick or whatever else we got going on here. Well, I uh, I know that you're limited for time today, but I I, I really do appreciate you coming on. Yeah, for sure. So I love where, talking about this shit. I do too. I enjoy. I I I look forward to our next conversation. Um. Let's wrap this up quickly. Where do people find you? Where they? Where do they follow you? Where? What's the best way to interact with Mister Fred here? Yep, I'm only on Instagram. That's all I can handle. So at Counting Coup Tactical, uh, underscores under each word. Coup is C O U P, not Coop, but it's Coup. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Um, I try to answer as much as I can when I can. Uh, but it's getting it's getting pretty crazy now. Super busy, and a lot of people have questions. I appreciate good. it though. Good thing. I appreciate I appreciate the time that you take to speak to people. So thank you very much. Uh, that being said, this has been the Redacted Culture Cast. We are closing up for the day. We thank you for the time that you spend with us. If you want to share this show with your friends, the family, the people in gun culture, it's a really the best way that we're going to grow in this day and age. I know if you listen to anybody on social media that is in our gun culture, they probably say the same thing, but that doesn't mean it's not true. The only way that this stuff gets out is if you share it with other people. We cannot. Uh, it's 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 hard to describe the vast difference between uh, what 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 tools are available to us within gun culture to spread the word on what we're talking about and try to be a part. Uh, just to be very clear, you think of it. You come from a marketing perspective, and I know marketing can be a dirty word, and it should be. It should, in some sense, remain that way because of the ways that people have hijacked it. But. Uh, we don't have access to all the same tools that everyone else has. So instead of this being a complaint, I hope that if this content and the material and the conversations that we have have made your life just a little bit better today. If you want to support the channel, you can head over to redactedculture.locals.com. We're going to start including some more conversations over there as well as, and that's going to be all behind, you know, if you want to support it um, in, a, in a Patreon sort of way as well as if you want to pick up some of the stuff that we're releasing, you can head over to redactedllc.com, find our merch and our shirts and our stickers and our goofy stuff there. I like to every once in a while come up with some boutique, quote unquote, tactical products. But if you want to follow us out, we'll talk to you later. And thank you very much. Keep your hatchet sharp and your powder dry.